Wendell Berry spoke at the first annual E.F. Schumacher Lectures on October 24, 1981 in South Hadley, Massachusetts. The E.F. Schumacher Society is a member-supported organization. For more information on the E.F. Schumacher Society, visit www.smallisbeautiful.org, call 413-528-1737, or write to 140 Jug End Road, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, 01230. America has always been fortunate in having at all stages of its development commentators who were able to step back and take a broad view of American life. Wendell Berry is one of these distinguished few, but what makes him even more unusual is that unlike many of the others, Per Calm, Alexis de Tocqueville, Gunnar Myrdal, he is a Native American, not a foreigner, born in Henry County, Kentucky, of Kentucky parents, and raised and educated in Kentucky, including bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Kentucky. He has had three careers which have been bound up together. First, he was a teacher of English and creative writing, including positions as professor and distinguished professor at the University of Kentucky and visiting professor at Stanford University. Second, he is an award-winning novelist, poet, and perhaps this country's greatest essayist. Some of his recent books include The Memory of Old Jack, a novel. A number of books of his poems, Clearing, Apart, Openings, among others. And this year, Recollected Essays. And third, he is a farmer who with his wife works a 60-acre farm alongside the Kentucky River at Port Royal. Fortunately for the rest of us, Mr. Berry not only farms and trains draft horses, but he thinks about farming and writes his thoughts down. Many of you are already familiar with The Unsettling of America, his great book on American culture and agriculture. And with his agricultural essays, many of which will be republished in book form next month under the title, The Gift of Good Land. We selected Wendell Berry to give one of our two Schumacher lecturers, the first in what we hope will be a long series, because we felt that he was one of the best people on earth to honor the work and the ideals of E.F. Schumacher. So without further preamble, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Wendell Berry. I don't deserve such praise, David, but I'll accept it. And because this meeting honors E.F. Schumacher, I read some more in him shortly before coming up here. And what impressed me this time were two things, the way he adhered to his values as a Christian when speaking as an economist, and two, his, his steadfast good cheer in the face of hard facts. We're all going to think, uh, think of hard facts at three o'clock in the morning and find good cheer hard to come by, and it's it's a real material value to have the companionship at such times of a man who maintained the spirit of E.F. Schumacher. I'm going to um, talk today on the theme of the conference, People, Land, and, and um, Community. But one of the themes of, of my talk is a Schumacher theme, that is the possibility of, of good work. 
and my general insistence, I suppose, is that good work is not something you just take off with your good intentions and start doing. It takes a long time to do it. Uh, none of us here will live to see handwork of the quality of, say, into stone masonry. And I speak, I reckon, as a sort of futurologist. I didn't realize that I was a futurologist till just lately, but I discovered not long ago that I belonged to the old Dutchman school of futurology. My neighbor at home tells about an old Dutchman who was building a stone wall, and he built it as wide as he built it tall. And the neighbors all gathered around and said, why do you do that? What do you build it as wide as you do tall for? Isn't that a great waste of rocks? Well, he said, when you build it that way, when it falls over, it'll still be tall enough. <laughs> to speak of people, land, and community all in the same phrase, in one breath, is to imply that there are connections among them. And even to imply so much is an advance over the prevailing assumption that such connections either do not exist or can safely be ignored. In spite of its popularity, this assumption can be described as not very smart. The whole inheritance of human wisdom is against it. It has always had its opponents, and as it grows toward calamity in our time, the number of its opponents is growing. More and more of us, understand that the connections joining people and land and community not only exist, but that to destroy or even to ignore them is finally to destroy people and land and community. I would like to become able to speak of these connections in their particularity, to describe, for example, the best human use of certain difficult hillside fields. And perhaps in preparation for that, I want to attempt to speak here of what I believe to be their nature. This is a difficult task, and perhaps I can approach it no better way than by examination of the obstacles. These are mental obstacles, of course, and so far as I can now see, there are two of them. First, the assumption that knowledge, information, can be sufficient. And two, the assumption that time and work are short. These assumptions will be found implicit in a whole set of contemporary beliefs that the future can be studied and planned for, that limited supplies can be wasted without harm, that good intentions are relevant to the use of nuclear power and other large-scale technologies. I have read, for example, a newspaper article saying that a congressionally mandated study of the Ogallala Aquifer is finding no great cause for alarm from its rapidly dropping levels. The director of the study says that even at current rates of pumping, the aquifer can supply the plains with water for another 40 to 50 years. <laughs> All six states participating in the study are forecasting increased farm yields based on improved technology. I have read another article that says, the nation has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in atomic weapons and at the same time has developed the most sophisticated strategies to fine-tune their use to avoid, to avoid holocaust. Yet the system that is meant to activate them is the weakest link in the chain. Thus, some have suggested that what may be needed are warning systems for the warning systems. Always, the assumption is that we can first set demons at large and then somehow become smart enough to control them. This is not childishness. It is not even human weakness. It is at least idiocy. And it may be that we will not cope with it and save ourselves until we regain the sense to call it evil. The trouble, as in our conscious moments we all know, is that we are terrifyingly ignorant. 